In the workplace today, redefining leadership means that you're open to the prospect of inclusive and collaborative approaches in order to get the job done. The most effective leaders eliminate rigid thinking and embrace innovation and encourage the strength of alternate perspectives in order to give you a view to make the most palatable decision for the organization so that everyone can prosper. The 2023 Gartner Senior Business and Executive Survey was conducted between July and December of 2022, and it revealed some interesting tidbits of information from approximately 400 CEOs from all across the globe, across different industries, revenues, and company sizes. Some food for thought, which we all should take note of, includes attracting and retaining talent remains a top workforce priority. Well, they were asked about the impact of various risk on business. 26% of CEOs reported they were concerned of talent shortages as the most damning risk across the entire organization. Furthermore, battling inflation and and properly balancing the increased use of technology over the capabilities of traditional manpower are also top of mind on the minds of CEOs as we round out the year. Reginald Bullock is a certified leadership coach, keynote speaker, and published author. He focuses on accountability, growth, motivation, resilience, and results. As the president and CEO of G-Town, he's responsible for strategizing and developing strategies for operational success, all intended to solve customer problems and drive business results. Bullock, join me this week to talk about inclusive leadership, succeeding in business, and developing a workplace culture where transformational leadership is individually defined and executed to ensure the prosperity and morale of the business, its people, and obtaining the objectives which are most important to all involved. It's a comprehensive conversation that any CEO or business leader could find immense value from. My conversation with Bullock starts right now. I don't want you to miss it, so make sure you pay close attention. I'm Kevin McShan. Let's have this conversation. Happy Monday to you too, and thank you. Absolutely. So, Reginald, tell me, I know that 
that you've been in the field of executive leadership for over 20 years, my friend. So tell me, what do you think and how do you qualify an elite leader? What does that mean to you? So to me, as a leader, it means that you are helping other people, right? And so at the end of the day, people don't care how much you know until you know, until they know how much you care. So when you care about people and you want to help people to become the best version of themselves, then strategically, you are thinking about them, their career, their family, their profession, personally, and how you are going to help them. And so the leadership piece is I put a lot of energy and effort into helping other people become the best version of themselves in any domain that they're in, at work, at home, with family, with friends, and you help grow another human being. And then as a, as a, a strong leader, you're doing it uh, on a scale where you're growing a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you're also a, a big believer in helping organizations solve problems, whether they be small, or complex. So what does it mean to you to be an effective pro problem solver within an organization? So in order to be that effective problem solver, you first have to understand what the challenge is. And therein lies where you have to listen, you have to strategically understand what they're talking about, you have to have a vision for the future, and you have to know what the resources are that you have available to achieve those goals and objectives that you and other people identify as true goals and objectives. So then you come up with a plan, a strategy and a plan that you can actually execute within a certain time frame and achieve those things. If you don't achieve those things, you're not effective. So often people come up with strategies but a strategy doesn't translate into results of achievement. So to be able to execute that strategy with a plan so that you can see the results and you can look at those tangible results and accept them, that's what makes you effective. And when you're able to do that consistently for organizations, for groups, for, uh, for people, for teams, for bureaus, uh, for different entities, now you have demonstrated effectiveness in developing those people, the organization, and achieving those goals and objectives. Yeah, and we, you know, one of the ways, uh, one, of the, one of the most effective and uh, compelling ways to solve organizational problems, Reginald, is to hire folks with uh, disabilities. And as I'm sure you know that October is National uh, Disability Employment Awareness Month. Uh, uh, I know you did your research on me, and I was born with um, so we're in proposal, so it's one of my passion projects in life. <clears throat> Outside of hosting this pro uh, podcast, I work with organizations to help them infuse more people with disabilities in the workforce. So tell me, what sort of uh, competitive advantage do you think folks with disabilities can add to uh, the workforce? So... Competitive advantage is on different levels, right? So first and foremost, a lot of the government, federal, state, local, educational institutions have policies that talk about uh, veterans or talk about disability preferences. So if you have a disability and they're trying to have a diverse organization of accessibility and inclusion and you are disabled, well, now they're able to look at you and say, okay, we need that person, right? Because they need to balance that out. And in terms of capabilities, in terms of uh, advantages, sometimes people with disabilities see things, understand things, and view things a whole lot different than a person who doesn't have a disability. You know, just keeping it real, I'm an African-American. And while everybody may be able to understand what being an African-American looks like, Unless you've been a black man like me, you really don't know everything that I go through. Several palsy. Unless you've had several palsy or you're going through that experience, then you really don't know. So you're able to bring a whole different dynamic and mindset to the team to be able to help all people and to be able to contribute to that team in a way that nobody else may be able to because of your experiences. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you talk about your experience, experience Reginald. I know you have the honor of, of commanding an F-16 fighter, and, and you uh, led organizations uh, during that time, and you got a good lesson in organizational shifts in college. So I'm wondering if you can tell me about that an experience and how it shaped you, my friend. Certainly. So being a commander in the military pretty much gives you 100% authority over your organization. So where the buck stops there, so to speak. So whatever it is you decide and whatever decisions you make, they're on you, good or bad. And that level of responsibility is, is not easy and I don't take it lightly. Being in charge of the F-16s, aircraft maintenance, which is the same F-16s, that defend the nation's capital, the White House and Congress in Washington, D.C. On a moment's notice, we're ready. That's a whole different level. And traditionally, in those type of organizations, it's been predominantly white males who have been the maintenance folks and, and, and the leaders. And so being an African-American uh, commander was unique to that organization, but it put me in a position to see things from a diverse lens where I can hire women and people of color and traditional people who might not have been able to achieve those types of positions, I was able to hire them too. And it gives me a unique perspective as a leader of the art of the possible when you do that. When you hire everybody who you're normally you know, seeing and you're used to hiring, that's one thing. But when you take a risk and you take a chance and you hire non-traditional people, and they're able to perform at a level of excellence that most people haven't seen before, then that brings the whole team together from a different diversity perspective. And it broadens everybody else's mindset on what can be done as they become leaders. So they're not stuck in a monolithic mindset. They're also now looking at the art of the possible from diversity because they experience. So as a leader, I was able to do that. I was able to hire so many different types of people who would never have gotten hired if it wasn't for me being in that position saying, you know what, I'm going to take a risk and take a chance on this person. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Reginald, I asked you earlier about uh, folks with disabilities, but I wanted to also ask you about inclusive leadership in general and how organizations can really implement uh, an inclusive culture within the workforce, because I believe that the and you make time for the things you prioritize, don't you? So tell me, how do we create an inclusive culture at work where everyone has a chance to feel like they're rowing in the same boat? Yeah, so, you know, I hate to say this, Kevin, but that is very difficult. I mean, it is hard because in many cases, it starts at the top. It starts with leadership. Most of those leaders who haven't traditionally done that don't know how to do it because they don't have the experience and they don't have the cultural um, development and mindset, right? So they can be in charge and they can say they want to do it, but executing it means it comes from the heart. You can't just do it because it's a policy. You can't just do it because somebody told you to do it. You got to do that inclusive leadership because you feel it. Because when you are doing it, how do you know that you achieved it? You don't if you really don't understand inclusive leadership. And here's the thing. I look around organizations all of the time. I look at their website. I look at their org chart. And that tells me what leadership really thinks. So if I see a completely diverse organization on the org chart, then I know what leadership thinks. But if I don't see it, but they're saying they want to have an inclusive environment, well, as an executive leadership coach, one of my responsibilities is to help leaders understand how to be leaders. So in many cases, Kevin, most of these leaders have not really been trained to be a real inclusive leader. They have not even been trained to be leaders. They got the position based on their resume. They got the position based on who they know. They got the position based on other, other elements, but in many cases, just because they're in charge doesn't mean that they're a real leader. And it's because of that that makes being able to develop an inclusive environment so difficult because it starts with the leader 
And if they're not that real strong, then they need to get trained on how to be in order for that organization to be. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Reginald, I know your uh, sort of sweet spot when it comes to leadership is building teams and helping them with their development strategies. So tell me, how do you think we build effective teams and how important is relationship building in that process as well? So um, how important is it? I'll, I'll, I'll switch the question, the relationship piece first. So when you're building relationships, you know, that's a buzzword, right? Building relationships, developing relationships. But what you're really doing is you're developing trust. You're developing trust in the relationship. You're developing trust in the people. They're developing trust in you. When you develop that trust, now you can go to the next level of communication. So in the relationship, it is all about communication. And they say relationship is key. But if a person doesn't trust you and you don't trust them, then you really can't build on that relationship for that organization to be as effective. So for me, when I'm building that, I'm looking for all types of people and understanding what do they come to the table with, right? Culturally, you never know what they know what they may have ex been exposed to. And doctrinally, you, know, you may not know how they've been indoctrinized in their mindset. So I try to get an understanding of who these people are, who this organization is. What are the types of people and what's their mindset? What have they been taught? What have they not been taught? And often some people have to overcome some stuff in order to become. And as a coach, I also try to help them to overcome some of those challenges that they may have had embedded in their mind. For instance, in the 80s and 90s, there, it was a male culture where, as far as they're concerned, women can't do the same thing as men. And if that's their mindset and that's their ideology, I have to help them overcome that in order to get them to work for Because I got to get that right. I got to develop their trust. Once I develop their trust, now they're able to understand the duties, the responsibilities, the vision, the mission, the goals, and the objectives of the organization in order for me to get I in to help them to achieve the organizational objectives so that the organization can be the com become the best version of itself. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, rather than based on all your experience, my friend, I'm curious, oh, from, from all your years in leadership, what's the greatest lesson you've learned about leadership and cultivating the potential of Greatest lesson is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. For instance, I could have an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD, and all kinds of certifications with three digits after my name. People don't care until they know how much you care about them. So I've learned that it's more important for me to focus on the people and caring about them than it is about my credentials, about my resume, about my education, because all of that stuff is what I did in the past. They're more concerned about what I'm going to do for now and in the future for them. And when they really know that you care about them, now they'll do anything for you. Now, They'll, they'll receive the fact that you're experienced and knowledgeable in a different perspective. But people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And as a leader, I tell folks, you shouldn't just care about the people who work for you because they may have a spouse and children and, and, and other people at home that they have to take care of. So you're responsible for them. They have children that are going to go to school one day and get educated. You're responsible for their college tuition in many respects because of their salary. They may need to take leave or they may have a disability. You're responsible for them and their extended family and friends. Now, when they know that you care about them and their family, then they are on your team and they care about you as well. And I, that's kind of the number one thing that I learned about leadership. 
Yeah, and to that point, Reginald, I'm wondering your thoughts on the social responsibility of leaders to really cultivate the passion of people that they lead. You know, no, no one will uh, follow a leader that they don't respect. So, so tell me, tell me, how do you think leaders have to play a role in really cultivating the passion of the people that they lead? Yeah, so I'm from the hood, Philadelphia, and we say stuff like, you can't fake the funk, right? And so, in other words, a lot of times leaders have to, first and foremost, believe in their people, believe in what they do, believe in the organization. And if the, their belief is not there, then that social responsibility is going to be a challenge. You know, for instance, disabilities. I'm sure you've come across the people who say, you know what, I really feel for, you know, people with disabilities and, and, and they're using the word disabilities like a, a, a buzzword or a cliche. But in the back of their mind, sometimes they don't really show that they care. They say they care, but they don't show they care. So the social responsibility, first and foremost, has to come from the heart. You really do need to care about the people who you are working with. You need to be you need to care about the affinity groups that are in your organization. You need to care about what they they care about. And when you do that, you do it by setting the example. You show up when they have meetings and, and they have events. You show up, you participate, and you, you post some of that on your own social media. You edify those people who are out there doing the good work in their communities. You know, when, when, when they're chairmen and board members and just members of various organizations and you don't even know that's one thing. But when you do know and you show up, that's another thing. So the social responsibility is these are human beings and, and these are real people who have real lives. And going back to the leadership mantra that I said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. When you are out there and you're doing the work with them and you're helping them and you believe in what they do and you're really showing that, then you're also showing that you care. And that's, you know, I can't, I can't use that term enough. You know, you care. You can't just say you care with your words. You got to show you care with your acts, actions. You got to show up. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I know you also help a leader sort of uh, execute and capitalize on the talents and uh, the talents that they have within their organization and within themselves. So tell me about uh, capitalizing on talent and really uh, being aware of the self-awareness you have to have to be an effective leader. What are your thoughts there? Oh, you said a couple of things. Self-awareness is huge, right? But you don't know how to do that unless you're taught how to do that. And as far as the talents and capitalizing off of the talents of those people in the organization, step one is know what they're talented in. Often, People in organizations have various talents, and most people don't know what those talents are. Even though they're in a position that has a position description with duties and responsibilities, and their resume may say they can do that, they may have talents in 10, 20 other areas. Right? They may be professional photographers or a DJ or writers or you know, counselors. You never know what else they do besides that position. So you got to communicate with them in order to figure out what that is. And sometimes the employees, they don't even know what their talents and other capabilities are. So you have to be able to listen to them from an experienced mindset to help them navigate the journey of discovering some things about them that they didn't even know that they were good at. When you identify those things, you're able to utilize all of those talents in the organization. For instance, most organizations have a holiday party every year. Most organizations may have a going away event or some sort of presentation. These people that work for you may be experts in that, but that's not in their position description and you don't know it until you talk to them. And when you give them the opportunity to do what they're good at, all you got to do is step back and, and let them do that. Now, the self-awareness piece is, you know, I'm, I'm Myers-Briggs certified, right? So I'm an ENT jet. And the self-awareness piece is knowing who you are and how you are 
and the impact you may have on others. When you don't know who you are and you don't know how you are and you don't know the impact you have on others, that's an uncontrolled leadership presentation that can actually be ineffective. So when you have self-awareness and you're you're and you know that you know and you're so good at knowing yourself, it allows you to see others for who they are and accept them for who they are. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Reginald, I want to also talk to you about the notion of setting expectations. You know, I've always lived my life through the motto that, uh, you, you know, the only expectations you have to reach are your own in life. And yes, it's important to have role models and uh, people to look up to, but if you don't set your own foundational level of expectations, it's hard to reach anybody else's. So tell me about setting goals and expect, expectations. How important is it for people to really harness their own individual talents in order to set those expectations? Because it's important, isn't it? It's very important, but it's only 50%. So setting expectations, setting goals, setting objectives is very important because that helps you to understand the future. For instance, you hear a lot of young folks say, I'm going to college when I graduate from high school. And that's a goal. But you don't hear them say, I'm going to college when I graduate from high school. I'm going to major in this. It's going to take four years. And in 2000, 27, I will graduate. So consequently, you'll get, you know, 100% people go to college, but they don't always graduate because they never set the goal for graduating. So that's why I say setting the goal is 50% because a lot of people set goals. I set goals, you set goals, organizations set goals. And that is important so that we're all on the same page of what we are trying to do. But the other part about setting goals that we don't often do is hold ourselves and others accountable to the goal. So in addition to setting goals, we also have to build in accountability to make sure those goals and objectives get done and get done within a, a reasonable time. That's why they have the SMART criteria for goal setting so that your goals are specific, measurable, uh, realistic, you know, attainable and timeline. If it doesn't meet your your smart criteria of those things, then it really isn't a goal. So how are you going to be accountable to it? It's just words. So I agree with you that we should set goals, but we should also know that it is a goal and how we're going to hold ourselves accountable to the goal. Because ultimately, it's not just about setting a goal. It's about achieving a goal. If I want to go to the Olympics, I could set that goal and never make it. But I want to go to the Olympics. So what are the accountability pieces that I have to do in order to really achieve the goal? Does that make sense? Absolutely. And, you know, Reginald, when you look at the world today, I'm curious, uh, do you think in some instances in today's world we suffer from a a lack of leadership from a corporate or from a business perspective? Do you think we suffer from a lack of leadership? So I'm a, I'm a certified executive leadership coach internationally. And, and that question gets a resounding yes. We definitely suffer from lack of leadership in every facet, not just corporate, in corporate, in government, education, in the household, in the community, we suffer from lack of leadership. And the reason why I say that is because many people are in leadership positions. Many people are in charge. Many people have authority. Many people have titles, but they're not really leaders. So you have a lot of people with all of these titles and in charge in the corporate world they're really not leaders. They are the position. Leadership is an altogether different level of responsibility. It requires a lot of work to be a good leader. It's almost like you have to put work and effort into being a good leader every single day. 
There's a lot of education training and developing yourself as a leader. There's so many things because of your background and cultural upbringing you have to overcome in order to become that leader. And some people just haven't put that work in. Some people don't want to put the work in. Some people just don't know that they should put the work in. And yet they call themselves leaders. They're not leaders at all. Consequently, to your point, we suffer from lack of leadership. I agree, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. So in that vein, do you just think leadership can be taught or do you think it's an ingrained sort of a capability? What are your thoughts then? So in, in one of my books, um, it's all about the hustle. I did a juxtapose of are leaders born or made? And ironically, um, I put there that leaders are taught. So leadership is a very, very huge responsibility because you're in charge of people and their lives. You're not born knowing all of this stuff. No more than I'm born knowing Arabic or Spanish or Portuguese or Italian. I have, I have to be taught that. So at birth, most children have to be taught what they know how to do. So for leaders, that responsibility is huge. And if you're a global leader, it's even larger. You need to be taught, but you, it, but you need to be taught by the right people, right? I'm a fourth degree martial artist. You can't have a person who's a fisherman teach somebody how to be a fourth degree martial artist. No, you need a master martial artist to teach a person how to be a fourth degree martial artist. Same thing with leadership. In order to be a very powerful leader, you need a very powerful, experienced, strong leader to teach you, to navigate you in that space, to mentor you, to coach you, to, to, to help you learn the things you don't and to help you qualify what you're learning. We don't have that. We just throw somebody in a position and say, you're in charge, you're a leader. That's not it. Leaders do need to be taught. Uh, there are a lot of books out there that people read. That's not teaching you to be a leader. That's you reading about leadership. You need to be taught by an experienced person or several to navigate you along your journey to becoming a strong leader. Yeah, and Reginald, I know uh, that you're also a professional speaker, my friend, and I know that authenticity is a big uh, connecting fabric to an audience when it comes to leadership and speaking. And you talked earlier about authenticity in the workplace. So how do you think leaders can uh, multiply or sustain authenticity, authenticity, whether they're a speaker, a leader, or a successful bus business person at all? That's hard sometimes, right? Because in order to be authentic, you got to be honest. And most of us are not necessarily honest with ourselves when it comes to ourselves. For instance, you know, some of us have a background that we know various cultures may not agree with. They may not, uh, they may not like it and they may even shy away from it. So if you present your authentic self, will that receive some backlash or will that receive some negative response from people? So we have a tendency to filter our authentic self to protect ourselves from whatever unknown may come back. But it's still important to be our authentic self because just like you have audiences out there that may not like your authentic self, there are audiences out there who will appreciate your authentic, authentic self, but they won't appreciate it if they don't know it. So it's important for me to let folks know that I come from the projects of Philadelphia, that I never met my fa my father. I'm a single parent. You know, my mother was on, on welfare for a while and we had food stamps and I was dyslexic and illiterate as a child growing up in the streets of Philadelphia, just trying to survive. And, and, and so that's me. That's my authentic. So the fact that I'm an executive and I have degrees and I have all of these other accomplishments Okay, that's my authentic self as well. So I try to present my whole self because audiences will resonate with the truth. 
more so than they will resonate with the lie or the filtered uh, mask of who you are because eventually the truth comes out. So I just try to be me as often as I can in the spirit of helping the audience to see themselves for who they really are so that they can become a better version of themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And Reginald, in the few minutes I have left with you this morning, I, I'm curious to ask you about, if, if I asked you to define your own sort of defining moment of difference and how do you celebrate the impact you've made on the world, how would you classify your defining moment of difference to this point in your life? Well, I would say the defining, there's so many, Kevin. I mean, that's a setup question, man, to try to figure out which one. <laughs> so uh, when I became an officer in the United States Air Force, that was a defining moment. I was enlisted in the United States Air Force for almost 13 years. And then I became an officer in the Air Force. And those two positions, duties, responsibilities, and authorities are very different. As an officer, I took the same oath of office as the Vice President of the United States. And that was really profound because it just let me know how powerful of a responsibility this is, how much authority I have to defend the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, based on the Constitution. But then all of the work that I had to do to be that good officer, to be that awesome officer that everybody respected, meant I had to let a lot of things go that I was used to doing. I had to change. I had to transform. I had to become more than I even knew I could ever become. And that was a defining moment because that set me on a trajectory of becoming the best version of myself. And I didn't know it at the time, but hindsight 2020, that probably was the defining moment that gave me the choice and the opportunity to transform, to change. And I embraced that change and I transform and I still continue to transform every day to become better. Yeah, and speaking of that, my final question for you uh, this morning is, when you look at your life and legacy, I'm curious, from a personal and Professional uh, perspective, how do you want your legacy to be determined? Uh, well, Mahalia Jackson was a very profound singer. And my mother, before she passed away, used to say, if I could help somebody along the journey or the road that they're going, may my living not be in vain. So... I just want to be able to help people. So my legacy is that I help people to become the best version of themselves. And as a result of everything that I've learned and know in doing so to help them, my living was not in vain. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, Reginald, I know you've got books and, and you've got uh, ways for people to to book you to speak, so if they want to get connected with you, my friend, what's the, the best way they can do that? So, my name is Reggie Bullock. I say go to www.reggiebullock.com. You can Google my name. I have websites. I'm on a Amazon. You can, you can purchase all four of my books. So, Google my name, Reggie Bullock or Reginald Bullock, and you will see everything that you need to see. Well, fantastic. Well, Reginald, this was a great way to stop my week talking about leadership and inclusion and everything in between, my friend. You're doing great work in the space of leadership, and I want to thank you for being here and engaging in conversation with me this morning. It's most appreciated. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for having me.